Few JRPG series can boast having their entire library of games set in the same world over a long period of time. Not so for Ark the Lad. The sixth entry in the series, Ark the Lad Twilight of the Spirits, is set around 1000 years following the conclusion of Ark the Lad 3. Produced for the Sony PlayStation 2 by developer Cattle Call, who some of you may recognise as producing Legend of Legacy and The Alliance Alive, Ark the Lad Twilight of the Spirits was released internationally between 2003 and 2004. To be frank, this game was the one that inspired me to start reviewing games on my channel in the first place. The first time I played it, I felt I was missing out on the references to previous games, so decided to jump all the way back to the Sony PlayStation with the first title in the series. What a journey it has been! And there is still more to go. Is Ark the Lad Twilight of the Spirits worth investing your time into? Though the game does have some faults, I would say yes, and urge you to sit back, relax, and let me unpack the reasons why. In the decades following the conclusion of the events witnessed in Ark the Lad 3, some monsters have gained sentience, allowing them to build their own societies. Evolved from different types of monsters, a variety of races have popped up internationally. Whilst they all have their own customs and traditions, collectively, all beings that are evolved from monsters are called Deimos. Everything isn't peachy in this world, however, as due to their heritage and inert violent nature, humans fear and despise the Deimos. It doesn't help that the resource that powers human machinery, spirit stones, are the very force that is necessary for Deimos to use their magical powers. Thus, the humans and Deimos are forever at war with one another. The game is played in chapters in which you alternate between controlling two characters, Karg and Dark. Karg is a human living in a small kingdom that has been dissolved of its monarchy for reasons not explained within the game. Despite the castle being in ruins, and Karg not officially being a prince, he is still often referred to as one. Life in his hometown of Yubel is mostly peaceful, with the occasional skirmish with the local Deimos happening over spirit stones found in a nearby canyon. On the other hand, Dark is a half Deimos who has been enslaved by a horrible creature that tortures him endlessly, and is constantly persecuted by those around him for not having pure Deimos blood. Dark dreams of finding his place in the world, despite his mixed heritage, which sees him hated by both Deimos and humans alike. Whilst on the surface, our two protagonists seem to be from very different worlds, as the story progresses, you'll come to learn how similar they are. Our protagonists both suddenly have a revelation when an artifact owned by their respective parents suddenly manifests a spirit, who was thought to have long departed from the world. The spirit, through a severe distortion, implores the aid of our respective protagonists. Unfortunately, due to the nature of the distortion, they both misinterpret what has been asked of them. This begins a quest to find the five great spirit stones that, when united, are fabled to grant the ultimate power, with each character believing that they can use it to eradicate the opposing race. Both characters have a supporting cast that will join them on their adventure. I've found that typically people that play this game tend to favour the Deimos party over the human one because of the sheer diversity of races that Dark's party contains. From Dark, the half Deimos, to a withered old Pianta tribe sage, a monster puppet master, an Orkon, and a Lupine, the party certainly does offer variety. Whilst I agree on some fronts that the party is interesting, I felt that more could have been done to explore the violent nature of their tribes. It seemed like as the story progressed, everyone suddenly developed human-like emotions and came to get along with each other almost as well as a capybara in a hot yuzu bath. But I guess in order to be palatable and relatable to the player, it needed to be this way. On the other hand, you have Karg's party, which is full of only humans, who whilst not overtly interesting, serve their purpose to drive the plot forward, sometimes in very cliché ways. Of the human party, I enjoyed that Paulette used a unique weapon that isn't typically seen wielded in many games. Maru also brought me a lot of joy with his dialogue and enduring innocent optimism, so I felt like both parties did have something to offer, and neither of them overstayed their welcome. Whilst the game likes to often paint the Deimos tribes as violent, through the NPC dialogue and world lore, the human nations are not without fault. The centre of the world's political power, Kathina, 
Whilst initially appearing as a place of paradise and sanctuary, it achieves this neutrality through its political leader's purposeful lack of ability to make decisions quickly, leaving smaller nations to fend for themselves. Additionally, the Cathenian citizens are entirely unwelcoming, xenophobic, and do not allow people to set foot in their city unless they are tourists, often exhibiting superiority complexes when spoken to. Then there's the nation of Dillsworld, which is currently on the offensive against the Deimos. Anyone that stands in their way, including human nations, are promptly stamped out or enslaved. I enjoyed that the game didn't paint the humans as faultless, because it causes the player to consider the situations in their own life where they may display privilege in comparison to those around them. One thing that I really enjoyed about the game world was that it was so steeped in history from the previous games in the series. There are many throwbacks to previous characters, and you can even get the chance to visit some old locations, albeit changed, too. I found it interesting to see how much a location had evolved or changed over the 1000 years since the end of Arcalad 3. Particularly, I really enjoyed visiting the Pacis Library, which preserved not only books, but also artifacts of historical relevance. It always brought a big smile to my face when I realised what each item was referencing. Thus, I'd recommend playing the previous games in this series first, in order to have a better, more rounded view of this game, as it is clear that Cattle Call did a lot of research on the previous titles when they were handed the development rights to this game. To progress the story, playing as either Karg or Dark, you will need to visit different locations and fight in many battles. The towns and cities are all fully explorable, with unique cultures and styles of dress for the citizens, which I found to be a nice touch and assisted in immersing me in the game's narrative. However, battle areas are generally extremely limited in the amount of exploration that can be done, with only a couple of areas that exist as more than one screen. When travelling between locations, you'll be taken to a world map where you can choose your destination, and your character will automatically travel a charted line to get there. Each point on the map represents a location, and sometimes when your character passes over one, they may be drawn into a random encounter. However, if you want to do some grinding, Choosing one of these points will automatically put you into a battle when your character arrives there. Ark the Lad Twilight of the Spirits evolved the battle system from previous titles by expunging the grid-based system in favour of free movement. When it is your character's turn, a blue circle will appear around them, representing their movement area. You can move your character anywhere within this circle, in any direction, and then attack, use an ability or magic, or use an item, for example. Attack areas differ for each character depending on their weapon type. For example, Maru's bow has a long range but a narrow attack area, whereas Bebadora has a wide attack area but a low range. If you want to check a character's attack range, or manually target an enemy, you can hold the R1 button and choose where you want to aim using the control stick. This is especially useful for characters like Maru or Camellia. You can also press the square button to allow you to free room with the cursor in order to survey the battlefield. Placing your characters to optimally attack the enemy is the key to winning battles. As enemies can block or dodge your attacks, it's often most advantageous to attack the enemy from the rear or the side. If a character becomes enraged in battle by sustaining a lot of damage, they can then create a combination attack with another character who is also in range. These attacks do a lot of damage. The casting of magic and abilities are all from spirit stones which come in a finite amount. If you use up all a character's spirit stones within a battle, then they cannot cast any more abilities or magic. Sometimes enemies may drop spirit stones when defeated, though if you don't have someone pick them up before the battle concludes, you will lose the opportunity to collect them. The same goes for items and money. If you are in a boss battle, I'd recommend always taking out the boss first, and leaving at least one minor enemy in order to get unique drops. Sometimes battles also contain breakable items. In certain story battles, these too contain unique items that are worth obtaining before concluding the battle. Both Karg and Dark will also gain a unique ability for use in battle in addition to travel. Karg gains an airship that he can summon into battle to shoot the foes for a lot of damage, whereas Dark gains a flying monster called a Pyron that can also attack the battlefield using special magic. Both require spirit stones in abundance to be able to utilise, so I didn't really tend to rely on them all that much. If you feel you need that extra edge in battle though, they can help you out of a pickle. Speaking of spirit stones, whilst they are not easily replenished, and you can burn through them quickly if you're not careful, I enjoyed this system as it linked directly to the lore of the world, 
and added an element of strategy to the battles. It's worth noting that you cannot increase the maximum capacity of spirit stones a character can hold by leveling up. There are some items that can be equipped to increase carrying capacity, but you need to decide whether it's worth it over other, sometimes more useful equipment, and this feeds even more into the strategy of the game. Characters don't equip new weapons as time goes on, but rather use the same weapon for the entire game. To augment their strength, a character can equip up to three attachments to the weapon, which will allow them to become stronger. Three attachments can also be added to a character's defensive equipment to give them an advantage in battle, such as being able to hold more spirit stones, block elemental attacks, or avoid status ailments, for example. Characters gain experience in battle by taking actions, like in previous titles, however simply doing nothing merits no reward. The amount of experience gained is proportionate to the amount of damage a character does, so the more damage they do, the more experience they will receive. This becomes problematic for healers, or characters that get left in the dust, as once some characters get their ultimate abilities, they can wipe the battlefield clean before anyone else gets a chance to attack. In addition to experience, characters also gain SP, which can be used to learn new abilities or magic. Each character has their own unique set of skills, though there are some overlaps. The abilities and magic a character can learn is related to their class rank, so you do not have access to the most powerful abilities in the game right from the get-go. A character will naturally rank up by gaining SP in battle, and the maximum rank is 8. I felt that whilst the system was functional, it was very linear and didn't offer much character customization. For example, Camellia is functionally a healer, and will never out-damage the bigger hitters like Volk or Dark with her physical attacks. When you feel tired of progressing the story, you can take a break to test your medal in one of the many arenas in the world. These provide unique challenges that not only allow you to quickly level the participating character, but also provide some good rewards. I would caution patience if you wish to partake in this activity, as the maximum number of rounds some of the arenas have are 30, and one restricts everything but physical attacks and item usage. It was a pain in the ass, but I'm glad to have gotten through it, as the reward was more than worth it. Though do note that if you intend to do the arena content, the characters that participate will far outlevel characters that don't, causing a huge discrepancy in damage output and defense. Arc the Lad Twilight of the Spirits marks a departure for the series from the use of 2D graphics, instead choosing to go all out with 3D. Similar to games like Final Fantasy X, this game uses 3D modeled environments with fixed camera angles to portray the various locations. The characters and enemies are also modeled in 3D, which hasn't aged all that badly. Almost all the enemies are 3D models of enemies that appeared in previous titles within the series, and I enjoyed seeing the glow ups that many of the monster designs received particularly the slots. They look so goofy, like that strange kid in third grade that dared to sniff a permanent marker and are now suffering the dazed consequences. The locations are all extremely unique and designed to reflect the culture of the people inhabiting them, so it was always exciting to arrive at a new destination. From the sweltering exotic surrounds of Milmana, to the smog-polluted industrial streets of the Dillswald capital, each environment had something new in store to see and experience. The soundtrack for Ark the Lad, Twilight of the Spirits was composed by a variety of talents. I liked this a lot as it meant that the music was incredibly varied between not only Karg and Dark scenarios, but also the various areas of the world. The compositions are sometimes so different that they can feel otherworldly, like they don't belong together in the same game. This isn't a complaint, but more so an observation, as I did really enjoy the variety. For the first time, voice acting appears outside of Battle Cries and helps to enhance some of the more emotional moments of the game. I won't let some monstrous dictator conquer our world! Though in battle, any time Maru took his turn, I always had a smile on my face from whatever came out of his mouth. Touch me and you'll be sorry! I did feel that the voice acting for Choco was a little tinny, however, uh, almost as though the voice actor was phoned in last minute and had to record in her own home rather than a professional recording studio. Maybe Choco foretold the COVID crisis. Choco is back! Wanna play with me? Let's play together! I enjoyed all the battle tracks, my favourite being Karg's Offense and Defense. The track in particular has such variety to it from the heavy guitarist at the beginning parting to reveal a triumphant melody of brass hope marching into the era of human prosperity. It's just simply perfection. 
arc the lad twilight of the spirits took some risks in the deviations that it made from previous titles in the series however i feel that they paid off giving us an enjoyable journey of two very different heroes that inevitably share the same goals the changes to the battle mechanics in terms of movement and spell usage were both interesting and not unwelcome if i had to complain about anything it would be that the arena battles are sometimes unfair in their rule stipulations that you cannot use abilities, but then the enemies can? I just didn't get that. Anyway, if you haven't played this game then I'd highly recommend it. If you don't have a PS2, that's okay, it can also be bought from the PS4 online store, replete with achievements, which I managed to platinum through the course of making this review, probably one of the first RPGs that I've ever platinumed on my PS4. By the way, Ark the Lad Twilight of the Spirits is a relatively unknown JRPG for the Sony PlayStation 2 that I only found out about a few years ago. Are there any lesser known PS2 games that you're familiar with? Let me know in the comments! This has been Venoir reviewing Ark the Lad Twilight of the Spirits for the Sony PlayStation 2. If you enjoyed this video, please feel free to leave me a like or consider subscribing as it helps me out a bunch. Please take care of yourselves and I hope to see you all again next time. Bye bye for now. Thank you.